it's kind of crazy because I say like it's the only time in the season where you're gonna go ride slush with all your friends and you're gonna have a blast and then sprinkled in the mix is like scaring the shit out of yourself on these huge jumps. It's like the Super Bowl. It's the best shapers and park builders in the world get together and build anything they want. You have all the best photographers there. The whole industry is there watching you ride. It's all about having fun and if you are having fun then you are going to do something that's, that's awesome. It's like a banger ending to the whole season. And I think this is my 10th or 11th. 17th Super Park, 9th. 7th. It's my first Super Park. Probably the first Super Park that made an impression on me was when 1999 came out. And there was the whole Super Park segment with Pat Bridges as the referee. Just always snowboarder magazines. Six at Breckenridge. That was probably the first one that I saw. And I would say ever since then, it's been the one magazine that I look forward to every year. The first time Super Park appeared on my radar, it wasn't a snowboarder magazine event. And now, a freestyle moment with Jeff Brushy. Prior to Super Park, there was Super Pipe. So we went up to Blackcomb to try to create this, this mega half pipe. And no one had built a half pipe at the time that was bigger than 12 feet. We decided to build this half pipe from hand. Every day we'd get out there and I'd be like, we gotta change this, we gotta make the wall bigger. It's not super, it needs to be more super. We were out to have the best in the world come and attend the Palmers and the Brushies and the Jamie Lynn's of the world to be there and to put on a show and do their best for us. That was the first moment when someone tried to create an event. It was not a contest, but it was a gathering in order to propel the sport forward and capture it all on film for the magazine. When that hit the magazines and hit the videos, the next season when kids went out to ride, they had a whole different perspective of how they were going to approach the mountains. The first I knew of Super Park, well, it was a story in Snowboarder magazine, but it was like a gathering of like A-list pros that you know one of Snowboarder's photographers, Sean Sullivan, put together at Squaw Valley. This was the actual beginning of Super Park. We built a park at Squaw Valley, and we had all kinds of people there. Brushy, Rayquit was obviously there. They had a couple boxes, and that was the first time I was like, damn, that's kind of gnarly. It became about picnic tables, rails, the very beginning of the evolution towards jibs. To have features built for snowboarding was just like, okay, great, now we have training. Dude, this is skateboarding, here we go. Jamie Lynn did the first 270 onto a rail there. Nobody really had ever hit shit like that. The limit of what was possible seemed so far off that no one knew where it was going to go from there. I didn't think every skier in the world would have crazy parks, you know, eight years later. You can't just build this train everywhere. <laughs> it is, you know. <laughs> Ingmar's heir and Rich Scronson, it marked a total paradigm shift in the sport. The ante went way up. And I think that that evolution can be seen in Super Park as well. You know who's been checking his list twice to find out who's been naughty or nice. And if you've been nice, you might get something real big under your tree this year. But for those of you who might be getting coal in your stocking, we're going to take you to the next best thing. And that's Big White Bridge, Columbia, to the Super Park. Yeah.
1997, Snowboarder Magazine grabbed the reins of Super Park, made it an official event, though it was invite only, and we brought on Mike Perillo to go up to Big White. You signed away your life, you went inside the gate, and you had to hit whatever Mike Perillo built. I just remember being so stoked because we had these rad jumps. It was like, it's not a contest and there's no pressure. And Super Park was unique on a couple levels. Now you didn't have bibs. You didn't have like two hours of practice time. And all of a sudden it was a free form opportunity for them to stack footage, but also to have fun and ride with people they didn't normally ride with. We had a good crew too, you know, it was the first year of Forum. So JP and Peter and, and Duffacy. Riding with Peter was definitely fresh for me. He was definitely better than us and had all the recognition. And I can just picture him hitting the jump. And you know, I remember thinking to myself, like, wow, like I'm alongside this guy now. Like this is gonna be fun and like this is the snowboard scene, like this is what's going on. And I don't think anybody really looked at it as like, oh, this is the new beginning, this is really gonna turn into something. I think it was just so like fresh that it's all about fun. Super Park was born in 1997. The next one was Dodge Ridge. Wet. Yeah, it was, um, that event was a struggle because um, it snowed and rained the whole time. I think we got 30 minutes of sun during the whole event. We actually, we actually did it twice. What I always remember is like the, the cloudy shot and then there's a hundred dollar bill at the end of the long rail. There was a hundred foot rail, uh, Doug or Rob put a hundred dollar bill at the end of it. And I think Kevin Jones was the one who got it. A perfect example of the Super Park ethos and where I think Super Park really found its bearings was 1999 here at Mammoth Mountain, California. It was a huge event, you know, you had the best of the best here. It really was an A-list event. Everything was just giant. I mean, Super Park it was the Super Park. No one built stuff that big. So when I started here, I was 22. I had a lot of ambition and my friends like Kurt Wastel and a lot of the other riders, you know, kind of influencing, you know, what they thought was possible. We took a chance and, and built a bunch of crazy features. doing that back one over the entire hip was realistically no smaller than the stuff that goes on on the hill today. Tom Gill is doing that huge back center in the half pipe. It just really stuck out as a craziness. There was one jump that was built that seemed ludicrous. I've never seen a jump that big before, no one had. It just seemed like something that was put there in the middle of nowhere, no landing in sight. But there was a landing, 112 feet away. It's called the Berserker. Kurt Wastel, he was feeling it that day. He'd been eyeing it up. Jamie Mossberg, the filmer, put a bounty on it. It was such a big jump that he had to get towed in by a snowmobile. And that right there was when Super Park grew up. That was when Super Park cemented its place and, and became like, no longer was it an experiment. It was now a yearly event on the calendar. I first started working for Snowboarder Magazine. I had my first byline printed in January of 1998. I tried to go out to Super Park at Dodge Ridge. They wouldn't let me. And then in 99, they brought me in and 
Interestingly, they had me run the gate access up at the top of the park. I was security at Super Park in 1999. So we camped it up and I was checking credentials and stuff and I had a paintball gun for people who were trying to poach and, you know, I was young. And it was funny though, you know, the people who tried to poach, you know, like Travis Parker, he's here right now at Super Park 20, he tried to poach and, you know, I, uh, you know, went off the hip and shot him in the back of the goggle strap of the head from 30 yards with a paintball when he went by me without showing his cred, you know, that happened. But it was cool, it gave me a front row seat to what, at the time, and still is, the best show on snow as far as snowboarding goes. The largest gathering of professional snowboarders in the world is Superbark.